the next speaker it is my privilege to introduce dr prakash k asra who is a direct is a cardiologist director of cardiac cath lab amri hospital kolkata and uh, is a specialist wireless pacemaker various uh, national and international conferences of course we all know that uh, uh, dapagliflozin have a targeted impact on heart lung kidney and other organs uh, systems uh, dr pk asra is going to talk to us on efficacy and safety of dapagliflozin in patients with and without type 2 diabetes hospitalized with covid we are talking about one communicable disease and non communicable disease blend and results from their 19 global randomized control trial over to you dr astra thank you dr paul uh, for your kind introductions i am a practicing cardiologist and i do care uh, i do practice in a private sector and most of the acute cardiac care patients are under me now in covid time we had two waves and we have one trial so the dear 19 is basically a trial for the first wave and there is a distinct difference between what ada has said 2021 based on first wave and there will be separate discussion maybe a extended leg of the trial or similar trial retrospective an experience of quick and so there is distinct difference between the mortality between first wave and the second wave in our hospital now there are two different sections of treating covid patients with or without diabetes with or without heart failure with or without heart ailment in our hospital and most of the private sector in india so definitely it makes a sense to differentiate and there is a distinct trend of difference in the treatment protocol between a cardiologist and a chronologist and intensivist in our hospital i am sure it is there in other hospital so during the first wave when covid came there was a lot of concern that dapagliflozins in covid patients if they are admitted in a critical conditions their u glycemic dka the glycemic control glycemic variability and the benefit of dapagliflozins for organ protections may actually cause more harm than benefit so that concept or that myth has been broken by ada consensus and a distinct discussions on their 19 trial though the primary endpoint could not be met again it is a small trial in the domain of sgl2 but it's a very large trial in the domain of sgl2 dapagliflozins in sick patients so if you talk about sickness and if you talk about covid this is a very good trial and unfortunately it missed the primary endpoint by having a confidence interval crossing 1 by 10 but what we have learned from this dear 19 trial and that has also been uh, i mean uh, i've been stressed by many uh, investigator who was a part of the trial and many people who has continued dapagliflozins during covid 19 is that it is very safe though the number uh, statistically may not be significant from lung point of view from cardiac point of view and nephrology point of view so it is a statistical loss or statistically i uh, statistically it could not win but it give lot of confidence amongst us especially in covid patients and they are 19 talks about mainly hypertensive patients 50% diabetic patients and it is not a pure heart failure trial it is not a pure ckd trial because the number of patients in their 19 is very small so what you have learned that uh, in india especially in my hospital i have not changed my practice for last 5 years whether it is systolic heart failure diastolic heart failure 
Aprep, Mrep. If somebody has got heart failure, acute heart failure, we do prescribe dapagliflozin and other progenes. We have evidence from soloistral for acute decompensated heart failure. We have an evidence with sotagliflozin in preserved ejection fractions, and we will have more data in Mpares. We have data from dapagliflozin and Mparade. We have Mparade for heart failure. The definition of heart failure has also changed after COVID. There is universal definitions, and in all forms of heart failure, stage A, stage B, stage C, stage D, definitely it makes a sense to use if they are admitted with COVID. Now, in COVID, if you have uh, uh, bacterial sepsis, where you can go back to your GLP-1, that is my standard practice, and there's a daily dose of uh, liraglutide in my uh, critical care, and that is injectable. And second choice definitely is insulin. Is only, insulin is very safe. But in cardiac care, if you prescribe GLP-1 injectable, the monitoring, the range of uh, uh, glycemic variability, hyperglycemia, and uh, unmonitored. Because of COVID time, there is a crunch of health professionals. There is a crunch of uh, the doctors, junior doctors. It's very difficult to monitor each and every patient every two hours on the sugar. So dapagliflozin in GLP-1 was a standard practice in my unit, and we have treated many hundreds of patients on dapagliflozin and GLP-1 by standard protocol in my hospital. But it may go uh, against the myths or I would say medical uh, uh, tribalism. Or what is medical tribalism? That means that some group of people, they still believe metformin and insulin in all forms of acute care in, 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 in during COVID. They don't want it to come out, but it's a new idea, and I don't think it uh, makes uh, it, it, it may be provocative, but it makes sense to use this kind of uh, altered uh, uh, protocol in special situations. So, dapagliflozin in DR19 has established one thing that it is safe. And if you develop UDK or you are puking, you are not able to eat, and if you are on ventilator or on rails to feeding, then the scene may be different. Uh, uh, it's no point giving a cross tablet through the rails tube. So mechanically ventilated patient, they are maintained on GLP-1 and insulin. But on the contrary, in acute care or endocrine care or intensivist care, it was only insulin. Uh, short acting, rapid acting insulin, there are thousands of varieties of insulin, thousands of protocols and thousands of uh, monitoring the, these patients initially started having a continuous monitoring in our hospital. But again, we ran out of the supply and uh, the manpower. So it makes sense to continue dapagliflozin who are coming here in the OPD, those who are not on mechanical ventilations, those who are not requiring inotropic support like NORADS or other things, those who are not uh, uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, those who are not requiring a bypass surgery. So these are the people who are relatively stable and ready to go home. They, are, they should get back their dapagliflozin when they're going back home. And most of the time, it has been stopped by the primary physician and it has been reintroduced in our hospital. If they come back with uh, symptomatic COVID, uh, not that sick patients, that means they're able to eat, uh, they're producing good amount of urine. In, in uh, diabetes or any other form, uh, this type 2 diabetes, the decay is very rare in elderly. UDK is very easy to manage and nobody dies due to UDKA like angioedema uh, due to any uh, AC inhibitor or, or RD. So UDK uh, is, should not be a really concern. You should give fluid, you should give their insulopenic, and you should give some amount of uh, insulin, and they do tolerate dapagliflozin. So I'm not proposing that all patients needs dapagliflozin, but who needs dapagliflozin, who needs this SGL2 should be continued under monitoring, their bicarbonate, their blood gases, their uh, CKDs, their creatinine level, all should be mon monitored. After having dapagliflozin, thousands of thousands of patients in last, uh, or all forms of SGLT2 in the last five years, we have seen the incidence of UDK in my lifetime, treating more than 7,000 patients on SGLT2 is only two. And I've never seen anybody dying due to UDK, and uh, it's not uh, different in, uh, uh, in the COVID time. What you have to do, you have to stop and give fluid, and the chance of uh, other infections are definitely high. Pyelonephritis is only one. So it is very safe, and that has been reinforced by Kosibor or uh, Dr. Verma and many other uh, scientists that it is safe. It has not met the primary endpoint. 
So uh, what I can conclude here, the DAPA G plugin is very effective in all forms of heart failure. We'll have more data. We ha I have learned from CBDDL that is going to be effective for all forms of heart failure. If you have a clinical syndromes of heart failure with pro BNP rise, troponin rise, irrespective of the ejection fractions, it should be given. Now we also know there is a difference between men and women's heart failure. The ejection fraction is, uh, there's a gradient of 5% between men and women. Uh, uh, I definitely makes sense to use more frequently in men, though they are uh, not, uh, should, should not be any discriminations, but there is more data that men are more uh, towards heart failure at 50% ejection fractions and 50% uh, ejection fractions, uh, sorry, women are more ha having heart failure at 50% ejection fraction than men. 50% ejection fraction may be a normal for men, and there is a gradient of 5 to 5%, 5 and some people say 3%, especially in Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my last sentence that Apaki Project is safe. India 19, we should continue. And with some interruption, if there is a bacterial sepsis, overwhelming sepsis, and a shock like condition. So, what